Well, I think we have critical mass and it's time to get started. Thank you all so much for coming this evening. This is Common Time, which is CDSS's monthly series. We have a range of topics and we're thrilled tonight to bring you Mary Devlin, who's going to talk about using NLP techniques as part of your caller's toolbox. Mary is an English and an American caller based in Oregon. She's called all across the country and all over Europe. She has been a program director for CDSS at a few different weeks and was president of our board a bunch of years ago. And Mary is an NLP master practitioner and trainer. And she loves to give yeah. workshops for callers and help train them. And so Mary will do it for us this evening. Before I hand over to Mary, I'm going to just give a few housekeeping things. Most of you know this because you're Zoom veterans, but please do stay muted throughout the presentation. If there is interference, I'll sort of run through the participant list and make sure everybody's muted. The mute button is usually along the bottom of your screen if you're on a laptop or on a PC, so look out for that. Mary will answer questions at the end of the presentation. Feel free to use the chat throughout, but I'll be monitoring the chat just in case there are any questions we need to pull out that we can pose to Mary at the very end. Please do type those in and I'll keep track of those for you. If you're having any technical issues, I will try to help solve those for you. So do also type those into the chat or you can message me separately. You can just look for my name in the participant list and send me a private message and I'll help you out as best I can. And the question everybody asks, yes, we are recording this presentation and I will share a link to the recording probably tomorrow, possibly Wednesday. And if you have any questions for me about CDSS or any programs that we do, feel free to ask those too. Mary, I'm gonna hand things over to you. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Joanne, and thank you for asking me to do this. Um, all right, so I, I, find that I don't know, I don't know everybody. I don't know what your experience is. I don't know what your interest specifically is, but I don't think it matters that I don't know that. <clears throat> um, I will uh, talk about some techniques I've pulled out of what I learned with NLP. Um, some are things to consider using with your dancers from the stage, and some are things to consider using for yourself. Um, there's a whole lot you can do to help yourself get um, better by paying attention to a few things. Um, this, I have to say, this is pretty weird. Um, NLP is kind of a hands-on thing in a way. So we'll work around that as best we can. And um, also it's extremely weird because I don't see you all and I don't, get feedback or responses. Don't get smiles or nods or frowns or whatever. So I'm just gonna imagine you all smiling and nodding. Um, I decided to learn NLP for a new consulting business I was starting up with a friend. Joseph O'Connor, he wrote the first book I ever read on NLP, um, has said, the NLP is the study of excellence and a model of how individuals structure their experience. And they modeled people, the, the creators of this, the organizers of it. They didn't really create much. They just pulled it from lots of places. Um, our, oh yes. Um, 
Well, it doesn't matter. If it does matter, put it in the notes and I will pull it out of my memory banks, but I won't take the time now. I became a certified trainer in 1996. <clears throat> and as I used this and learned it, it, well, I never used it too much with individuals, um, but I saw some things that were really, I thought, relevant for dance and for dance teaching. I noticed, started noticing what happened, happens when callers say certain things. And what my response is, and I decided to, to go on a um, rampage of sorts, <laughs> whenever I could, to change the common language in a very slight way. Um, for example, I want you all right now to think about a flying pig. You got it? How did you do it? I'm betting that to think of a flying, to, to not think of a flying pig, I hope I said not, <laughs> um, you have to think about it first. I found this to be very true that the brain, the subconscious, unconscious, whatever, doesn't really process a negative. Um, some of you may have heard this story, but it, to me, it vividly illustrates this. Uh, for this new consulting business, I was um, with friends who were paragliders and we were forming a business that would be kind of like outward bound for business people. And I, parenthetically, I just wanna say, I'm so glad it didn't go anywhere because we didn't really think through the liability. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, so I was having my first experience paragliding uh, and it was in a, on a, a steep hill, but just a hill, not a cliff. Um, and uh, the deal was you have your wing behind you and you have your arms and you run, run, run down the hill and it gets enough and the wing comes up, it lifts you up and it creates a seat for you to sit in and you're, you're off. Um, so I heard Larry, instructor saying, Well, what I interpreted him saying was stop, don't know. Um, what he was actually saying was don't stop, don't stop. Oh good, two words that were not useful. And so of course I stopped running. I thought something had gone awry. I didn't know, maybe a, a bull got into, um, into the field because it was a cow pasture with nettles and things and cow pies. <laughs> and as I fell down the, because stopped running and, and um, slid face first down the hill, thinking, shit, oh, I hope not literally. <laughs> um, so, when, when I landed, as it were, I um, told Larry my experience and basically said, if you ever say don't to another student or stop, blah, 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 I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> um, so you really want to put things in the positive, um, positive language. Try is another word that's really important to use as you want it to. We have a habit of saying, oh, try this, try that, go ahead, try it. And maybe that's what you mean. And if it is, great. But if you're saying it as uh, instead of do it, it's not a good idea. So using the word try very, um, 
purposefully is a good idea to do. You know, we're lucky as dance callers because we, uh, we know how our communication is coming across. One thing that NLP holds is that the meaning of communication is the response you get um, and its effect. And if we are not communicating clearly, we'll in all likelihood see it on the dance floor with, you know, they'll tell us like, what, what, what? Or um, just not doing it or whatever. So we get pretty quick feedback. And that's one of the great things about what we do. It can be frustrating, of course, but it's a real encourager to, um, do better in our communicating. Oh, I just so, well, no. Um, I'm just gonna say, look where you want to go. That first time I did paragliding, um, there were some big trees over there and I realized I was starting to drift toward them because I was looking at them, you know, saying, oh shit, there's this tree and I'm approaching it. And Larry started yelling, look away from that tree. <laughs> so, okay, now look the other way. And that helped shift my balance because you steer a paraglider, um, a wing, um, just by shifting your body and in your arms, that. Uh, so by looking away, that got me heading away from a really unfortunate consequence of looking at a big tree when I was in the air. You know, we've all, I suspect, seen the, what I think of as the black hole of dancers. Um, it's that group over there that's not doing well, that's having a hard time, that's um, helping each other not know what to do in whatever form that's taking. And I learned, <clears throat> as I'm sure we all have, um, that to watch them is a bad idea because you want to help them, you want to give them assistance, you might think that you need to see what they're doing to be able to give that assistance. In fact, what you're likely to do is, in calling to them, get everybody else off. Um, this happened to me <laughs> the first time I called at Folk Life, which was pretty early in my calling career. And I thought, oh, so look where I want to go. Look what's happening nicely, all to them. Use voice to emphasize the key elements and hope that those who are not on the same program um, will, will get it and shift over. <laughs> One of the most interesting times like that was in California, and I think the hillbillies were playing, as I recall, and uh, there was a down the hall foreign line. And I noticed at one point that they were getting off and before I, <laughs> before I, it happened very fast, how they got eight beats off. So we were having people going um, up the hall, Gosh, there's my hand. Up the hall and down the hall. Yeah, yeah. so that was um, important to figure out which was the right thing and call loudly and forcefully to that timing. <laughs> oh, that wasn't really NLP stuff. That was just do what you have to do.
Um, other useful things for callers. Act as if true. Um, and that, that's not, you know, invented by NLP. We've heard that other times. I, in high school, I was mm, really shy, really, really shy. And, uh, and in college, well, a little bit less, but still it was not a handy thing for me. It wasn't serving me well. When I, I, I after college, I <clears throat> moved to London and I thought, this is my chance to um, change it. So I got over there, of course, nobody knew me. And uh, I started acting as if I was, um, <laughs> it's gonna sound funny, but a, you know, a friendly and approachable and um, not shy person. Got better at it, came back to this country five years later and um, went to do my master in library science at the U of O. <clears throat> and I was mindful at that point that uh, there are, there were a glut of librarians. There had not been necessarily when I first got this idea. Um, but so I had to differentiate myself. So when no one replied in response to the question, who will be uh, like president of the library students? No one said anything. And I said, I will. Shocking myself, possibly others. Um, and this was, of course, resume building, but it also is good practice. And by the time I finished that program, I was doing pretty well in uh, overcoming the shyness. And the final bit was when I joined an Appalachian clogging group in Portland and got up on stage to perform, which was so much fun. And I thought, hey, I, I like this. I like being on stage. So that is one thing that happened that from acting as if, I liked it, I came to like it, which is real handy if you're calling. <laughs> um, may not have started that otherwise. Uh, let's see. When you are calling or teaching and make a mistake, and I know that, I'm guessing that none of us have done that, no mistakes ever. <laughs> um, what you want to, I mean, some are just little, you know, and you just correct it and go on. Some, some are bigger and would make a difference if, if, um, if, you know, it keeps in people's head. So you want to do what's called break state. And to do that, <clears throat> You can, for example, everybody say, you say stop. Okay, everybody at the top of your head or turn around or do you smell popcorn? Or anything that's like so not what you've been doing. And that will, excuse me, it's kind of a reset button if you will, um, and then carry on and, and do it right. Or you can, yeah, doing the reset is a really good idea um, to get what you did incorrectly out of their heads. And you can also, if you say something, uh, you know, we have some, no, well, I guess they're kind of 
unstated rules, like don't swear into the microphone. Um, people in the past used to make it a, uh, an actual rule. We probably don't need to say that these days, but you never know. Anyway, so if you say, for example, what, what, could, what would I not say? What would I avoid saying? Um, that could possibly come out of my mouth. Hmm. Well, how about this? What the hell are you guys doing? Not very productive. So what I would do in that case is move away from, from where you're standing and look at the spot where you were standing. You can't see my hand pointing. I'll get it up here and point. <laughs> um, and say, I can't believe she said that. And people kind of laugh and they tend to forget what you said, which is good. Um, that speaks to, to the idea of setting some spatial anchors on the stage. What you wanna do is teach people, if you will, that when you are standing at the mic, it's time to really pay attention. You're going to be giving important information and calling and they wanna hear it. They do want to hear it, even if that hasn't dawned on them yet. Um, so when you're, if you do any kind of blah, blah, blah uh, about things that are not particularly germane or, or whatever. If you're a real talky kind of caller, which I hope you're not, but if you are, um, if you move away, then you can have a spot over there that's the place where you go when you're going to just kind of like blah, blah, blah. And then when you move back to where the mic is, you're ready to go. Um, so that's a good reason too, to, to be real careful what you say when you're at the mic. You don't wanna train people, and what we're doing is training them. Uh, to just keep on keeping on with whatever they're doing. This is a helpful way to start that approach of, of uh, when it's okay to talk amongst yourselves or whatever, and when it's not. Um, let's see. Okay, speaking of anchors, when I started calling, uh, I wanted to be sure that I was in what I call uptime. Uh, you know, really up uh, as much as possible. So I decided to make an anchor for myself to use before I started an evening. Um, and this was contra. I hadn't. I don't think I'd started calling English yet. Um, so it was. It was. You know, I was pretty new. And um, at that time, there were um, these little, like, lipstick things that were aromatherapy. Um, that I had one that was called Joy, and one that was called, oh gosh, what were they? Well, I'll stick with that because joy is an important part of, of what we're wanting to achieve in the Hall of Dancers and Musicians. So right before we started, I would go, you know, behind a curtain somewhere, take out my little <laughs> sniffer and, and take a few hits of it. Um, and I 
made that into an anchor for pup time for all right, here we go. Um, and that is, uh, that is really, I'm sorry, I distracted myself. I looked over at a note from Todd saying that you're smiling and nodding till your necks are strained. Okay, good, good. I'll hold that image. Accepting the neck straining part, that's mm, not so good. Um, uh, let's see. So you want to do uh, those anchors for yourself and the anchors for the dancers. Those are those facial things I talked about. And it isn't necessarily moving away from, if you have a headset, um, you just simply change where you are. If you have a handheld, you may want to take it with you if you're going to say something, because there's no point in being inaudible. But maybe you just move away to let things settle down. So anyway, it's no problem if you're wearing a, a headset. In managing yourself, it's really important to believe in your own excellence. And you um, have to do that with your thoughts. And have a belief in that excellence that, you know, I'm, I'm a darn good caller and I'm going to do an excellent job. And uh, if something happens, I can handle it. And just hold that in your mind. An important piece is smiling. So you know how when you smile, it changes your voice. Uh, just like when you stand up, your voice changes. Um, anyone who's ever done a phone interview for a job knows, or, or I hope knows, that you stand up for it because that gives more energy to your voice, which we naturally have because we're standing up to call, but um, uh, you want to to just um, smile, get that into your voice, and project, "I've got you. You're okay, guys." This to the dancers. Um, you are fine. You know, you're going to do what I say, and it's going to be so fun. And all that is. Not, of course, said directly, but that's the message. When I find I'm having trouble, uh, my main tool is smiling. Um, <laughs> if things are not working out so well on the floor, you know, even if, you know, just like one square out of eight is having difficulties. I mean, I hope they just go ahead and make up and do something, but um, I start smiling more and then more. And then pretty soon I'm like a grinning fool, just <laughs> thinking, isn't this fun? Isn't this fun? Um, and also thinking um, about But let's see if I can pull it up. Well, smiling beliefs in your excellence and managing your thoughts are the key points. 
modeling. So we learn a lot from other callers and dancers, uh, a whole lot. When I started calling, and then I was then I was starting to pay attention in a way I hadn't before. When I was a dancer only, um, I just danced. Uh, when when I got interested in calling, I started paying much more attention to the callers. And I found sometimes there were things that I thought were just great. It worked so well. Um, wow, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to do that. And then there were times when it didn't work so well. And I was thinking, well, what's happening? What's that person doing that would be better avoided? Um, I really, I mean, I can remember thinking as I was dancing sometimes um, that I had to translate when someone said, you know, don't circle halfway. <clears throat> circle all the way. I would have to just in my mind delete, don't circle halfway. I just hold on to circle all the way. Um, and that made it easier, but it also made me wish quite a lot that the caller hadn't said what not to do because it's confusing. And then inevitably there are some people who are stopping circling halfway. I mean, they just, they, that's what they, anyway, that's what they heard. I also use modeling <clears throat> as a dancer, of course. Uh, I spent time watching, watching carefully uh, what, what is someone doing? I, you know, you can look out at the floor and, and you just know who the really good dancers are because there's a certain something about the way they carry themselves or where they move or there's, there are things you can pick up and say, that person is good. Now, analyze why. Um, and I would do that. I remember when I started going to <clears throat> English American week, or maybe it was English week, and I was at that point still pretty new as an English dancer. Um, and it was really evident that some people got it really, they were so good, and some people didn't. And so I just paid attention to the ones who were great. And um, um, that was fun because I, I learned so much so fast, and then I'd when I get back on the floor, and this involves sitting out, of course, to really focus on it. Um, my hydrocephalus is kicking in. <laughs> what was I going to say? Um, oh, well, that was the point. Don't need to say it again. Modeling, your modeling uh, too for others. And you, I think we always, we talk about how important it is for callers to be good dancers, really good dancers, because you're providing a model for what dancers will do and will perceive as being an okay thing to do. So, this isn't NLP by any means, it's just common sense um, that we really do our best when we're on the floor and we avoid all those things that can happen like, like talking and uh, coaching on the floor and things like that that are really counterproductive. Um,
So I do see a question that I'd like to talk about right now. I was wondering if I should, because it's pretty hard without being physically in the same place. But the question is, um, how do we create an anchor for ourselves? The best way, well, you need, You need to get yourself into a state where you are remembering a time when you were really excellent, or you were really on the top of your game, or you were really having a blast, really fun, some extremely positive stuff. And, um, and let's say you can do it with, you know, an earlobe. You don't want to make your anchor anything you're used to doing very much at all. That's why I use my little aroma tube. Uh, now I'd probably carry around <clears throat> some, some of that, um, um, those little bottles of scent. Um, they're pretty strong, which is good. Uh, so get yourself back into a time, remember a time when you were really on the top of your calling game. How did that feel? Remember that. What did you see? You might remember seeing the dancers all moving in sync and having a great time and people looking up and smiling and having a fine, fine time. And what did you hear? Well, claps, hoops, the music, of course. That's a fine anchor, is just to hear the music when, when the band's good. Um, and when you have that, the image and what you're hearing in your mind and what you're seeing, then set the anchor. So let taking that tube idea, we'll take a big sniff. And since I don't do that regularly in daily life, keeping it unique to the situation, it becomes an anchor and you do that more than once. You might wanna do that maybe five, six times. And after you have really, you know, cultured yourself, accustomed yourself to doing that, um, then test it and just sniff and see what happens. If the anchor is taken, it's going to, you know, send you into a real upstate, a real good place, and uh, use that. If I were with you, I would be helping you set the anchor, encouraging you to do these things that I said, the visioning and so on. But since we're not, I encourage you to go ahead and play with it and see what you can do. Um, I think it's perfectly possible to set your own anchor. Uh, it's just a little harder because the if I were doing it for you, I would be watching very intently. I'd be watching your face to see when those memories were reaching a peak. And you can tell that because there's some very small movements that happen in your face and change the planes of your face and the light reflects differently. So you can see when somebody has changed from one state to another. Uh, it's pretty cool.
it takes careful observation. And I don't know if you can do it for yourself, that careful observation, but you can give it a go. Why not? This is a case where I think the word try is, is appropriate. Um, try it. Does it work? See if it works for you. Uh, do anything you need to do to shift what I've been saying to do and try that. See what works. So that's a case where the word try is important. The word try is also important in the sense of avoiding it. I almost said not saying it. <laughs> uh, avoiding it. Um, so how productive is this? Okay. Okay. So we're going to try this. Um, Yep, I, I, yep, we're going to try it. And it's, it's really hard. Um, I don't know how, how, uh, how well this is going to go, but I'm in some long description and followed with. Now you, now you try that. Um, well, probably not going to go so well, uh, largely because they're trying it. Try should be reserved for times when, when it's actually the word you want. When you want people to try a new figure, try out a new dance, um, see what you think. So I um, encourage you to make that another word that you're very, very conscious of and use with its what I would think of, what I do think of, as its real meaning, at least for us in this context. Um, 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 um. So Mary, a number of questions have come into the chat and I can post some of them to you now or we can oh. wait a few minutes whenever it's a good time for you. Okay. Well, since I'm muttering to myself kind of audibly about what I'm going to do next, let's do questions. So here is a question just based on some of the things you've been talking about someone asks if you can kind of reiterate what is this concept of an anchor? Okay. If you could go over that one more time. Okay. The idea of an anchor is, um, yeah. You could, it's to anchor a specific state in a person. Uh, so a state is your, you know, emotional sense now, and and it calls on past resources. Is probably the most important thing. Anytime someone's in an intense state, and at the peak of that experience, if you apply a specific stimulus then those two become linked neurologically. And anchoring can assist you in gaining access to past states and linking the past state to the present. So that means that you can draw on your past successes by create, using that to, to create um, the anchor for use in the present and the future. Um, that's why it's important to pick a really good state, um, why it's important to make it as vivid and real as possible, um, 
to, as I said, really see there. Um, and I think it would be wise to be in your body rather than seeing yourself. So you want to have this be associated rather than dissociated. Um, so the intensity of that past experience and then apply an anchor, it's, it's that, it wouldn't be because that'd be a stupid thing to uh, make as an anchor. Best if it's a little surreptitious and something that doesn't involve, you know, getting mm, something you only use when you purposefully want to use it. Um, the keys to anchoring is using the intensity of the experience, the timing of the anchor, that is when you feel that time starting to peak just before the peak, the uniqueness of the stimulus, and I've said that already, and then that you can replicate it. So if, if you wanna make your stimulus something um, highly unusual or hard, to get to or whatever, don't pick that one. <laughs> Do something simpler. Huh. So you recall that vivid past experience. Give yourself the specific stimulus at the peak. Then you wanna change your state so you don't muddy the stimulus. So then you like, so kind of like walk here, walk there, do go get popcorn, whatever, and then test, Repl replicate the stimulus. And we use anchors all the time. We just don't necessarily call them that. Um, how about stoplights? You see that red and you stop. Well, I hope you do, and others. Um, alarm clock, different tastes, different smells, uh, all kinds of things can bring back uh, anchors. When, when we hear songs or tunes from our past, that can be an anchor. You know, the favorite song in high school, powerful anchor, even though you haven't, you know, you haven't made a physical anchor, but hearing that, and possibly that's when you realize what a horrid song it really is, but you liked it then, and you really probably weren't too conscious of, oh, let's say misogyny. Um, it takes you back. Ah. Uh, So, Joanna, how was that? How I think you... that was fine. And there are a few other situational questions that I'm hoping you can comment on that have come into the chat. Um, Happy to. One question is, what techniques would you use if the dancers are calling out from the floor? Like, what Ugh. can you do as the caller to handle that? Calling out to me, the caller, or to other dancers? Uh, probably either or both, but how about to you, the caller? To you, the caller. Um, it would depend where I was, if I was in the teaching part. And that's, you know, that's when you get people running up and saying, actually, da, 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 and they might be right, and <laughs> they might not. Um, just say thank you. You don't want to get in a debate. Uh, just thank you. On the floor to the dancers in your set is rather different. Uh, if necessary, I, I and others have been known to stop the dance 
kind of say, okay, let's reset. Um, and remember that the voice you want to hear is mine and only mine. So if you've been doing some helping, know that it's not helpful. It blocks the sound of my voice. It blocks the understanding. Uh, you know, there's so many negatives about it, really. Um, knowing, it just overloads people, especially new people who, who, who honestly may need help, but that's not it. The best thing, the kindest thing you can do is be quiet and really model paying attention. If, if you're a hot shit dancer and are doing all kinds of disruptive stuff uh, in your set and, and you see this new person or unsure person, or whatever, uh, be kind and stop it. Um, You stop it and then just go on. But, so, and go ahead, go ahead. Here's a follow up question to that is coaching on the floor from one dancer to another always counterproductive? Are Pretty there much. other ways of helping dancers? Uh, yeah, another counterproductive one is physically assisting them or becoming very annoying by every time they're supposed to, you know, cross the set, you go big sweeping movement, reminding them to cross. They know perfectly well after a few times what to do. I always think it's best to let people make mistakes and let them figure out, um, let them figure it out. Then they really know what they're supposed to do. And you can encourage this by letting people know that a very positive thing you can do is look up. If you're looking down, you see your feet, but you've already met them. Um, it's, it's just so important to see what's going on around you. And then, and you could even express that this is the best way to get help. Notice who's in that set in the next in the next line. If they seem to be on top of it, kind of keep an eye on what they do. Kind of glance, and uh, they can you can learn that way. Um, pretty much anything that avoids talking, pushing, pulling, sweeping gestures, and it seems like there's nothing after those. But there are, you can look meaningfully in a direction or smile and nod and yeah, go ahead. Um, as long as you don't keep doing it. I've had a fair number of people come and say, you know, I really have trouble dancing with so-and-so because they keep on helping me and I don't need it. Uh, yeah, that's really very annoying. So ideally the person getting the unwanted help will be able to say something like, I'm okay, you can stop now in a very kind way um, or maybe not. Or maybe you wanna have a private conversation with, uh, the helper offline, I mean, not in public, and let them know their effect. <laughs> Meaning of communication is the response it gets, it's the effect it has. And if the effect is someone going, even if they're not um, really doing it to you, but they're, they're like, you can see people are like, <laughs> um, Notice that and just don't, just stop. Once, maybe twice, but after that, 
and it's like calling, you know, um, you call this piece of the dance and then the next piece and it's at the beginning of the dance and you're using quite a few words with your partner, our man left once and a half. And then I, I think of it as successive approximations. I start backing off. I might um, say, Alaman left. I might say, Alaman, reaching the point where I can just say Alaman or just say partner. And uh, in the context of the dance, probably Alaman is more meaningful than partner because you're probably doing a couple things with your partner. But um, just and then watch intently and see if people are getting it if they need more words, give them more words that will do something to prevent others from talking. Um, and you might even get a little louder with your more words. I, hmm. I think that's one of the real difficult things we have to deal with because it's kind of an unwritten rule, or maybe it is written, I don't know, um, that we should not pick people out of the dancers and say, you, <laughs> you are a menace, you know? Unless, uh, well, yeah, unless they actually are really a hazard. And sometimes that's the case, but usually it's not. Um, I think that's what I had to say about that. So here's another question that has come in, and this is about uh, specific language choices. Uh, one of our participants has been told by other callers to not use the phrase, you are going to, when you're giving instructions to dancers. So any thoughts about that? Does NLP theory have anything to say about that particular word choice? Not specifically, but it, it of course is about a future action and, and it takes a lot of words. So ideally you're saying what to do now and, and you're being succinct. You are going to, so there's four unneeded words. If you're going to swing, you could just say swing. Uh, just work on getting it down because the more the caller is speaking, the more noise there is in the room. And that's noise in the sense of sound, but it's also noise in the sense of what's important here. It's the same thing with going to a different spot that you've selected when you're going to blah, blah, blah. And I don't, don't mean you should step over here and say, now in a minute, you're going to run back to your anchored spot, swing. <laughs> no, it'd be kind of funny actually, but I have, <laughs> I don't want to try it. Um, yeah, so, Um, Thank you for that. I think that's helpful. Okay, uh, one other question has come in, and if you have any other questions, this is a great moment to type them into the chat, and I will pose them to Mary. But somebody asks about the origins of NLP. You didn't say very much about that, and specifically about the phrase you used at the beginning of the presentation, which is, don't think of a flying pig. And the question is uh, that uh, brought to mind the work of George Lakoff. Susan, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, don't think of an elephant. And does NLP have anything to do with that work in origin? Yes, yes. yes. He's one of the, uh, Lakoff is, um, someone that the NLP folks, uh, Richard Bandler, let's see if I remember, Bandler and Grinder, Grinder, 
looked at. <clears throat> and that's where they got the idea of the, the elephant. Or I, since everybody says elephant, I pick something else, a polka dot tree, I don't know, whatever. Something odd, something you have to really construct. Um, I, I think Lakoff is great. Other people that they used, um, you may be familiar a bit with Virginia Satir and a piece they took from, so she was a psychiatrist, psychologist, and she developed what she called the Satir categories. And let's see if I can do this. Um, Sometimes when I'm teaching people, callers, uh, they do unusual, funny, awkward, not so helpful things with their bodies. So, well, you can see some of the salient point. The best way to, to be on the stage, you might be holding on. Um, but is to be square on your feet and even have your hands just slightly like that. That's a very grounding kind of position and gives you authority, it's authoritative. Some other positions that you might be in sometimes, one is called computer. There's, oh golly, it's going to close it. One, uh, the distractor, and that's when you're standing all akimbo and maybe even have your legs crossed and, you know, different angles and you keep changing them. And that's really not helpful. So think about how, how you're positioning your body. And if you're using it in a way that um, uh, gives you the weight and authority that is yours. Uh, I, she has a few more categories and I'm not remembering them right now. Another person who they did a lot of modeling on is... Um, Uh, he's a psychologist, hypnotist, did a whole lot of hypnotherapy stuff. Um, see if I can have a few little notes here. But do they give his name? They do not. Um, I want to say Fritz Perls, but it's not. That's just what's coming into my mind. This is the guy brilliant. We talked about the owl in the garage. If that triggers anything for anybody. Um, the voice will go with you. Hmm? Well, so, I think the guy you're thinking of is the, the byline was, and my voice will go with you. Yes. Yes. Do you think of, think of his name? So Mary, if you have those kinds of recommendations, or if you want to think about those or assemble something, I can always pass them along to everybody in a follow-up email. So that is definitely Great. something I'm happy Great. to do. Yeah. Um, I just, my, my eyes just glanced, and, and I will, I will do a short bibliography. Unfortunately, the book I like the most is not only out of print, but my copy is loaned out. Um, but I think I can recall enough so you can see if you can find it. It's what convinced me to take NLP courses. I was in Seattle at the UW Bookshop. I fell on this called Introducing NLP. Yeah. And uh, bought it, read it. So that's what I want to learn to add into my consulting and training work. Um, so, uh, and there are a lot of 
of people who were really excellent at what they do or did that they drew on. Um, hardly anything is made out of whole cloth in this. It's, it's a bit here, a bit there. Yeah. Um, I see uh, that there are a couple more questions and I'd definitely love to get your thoughts on these before we have okay. to sign off for today. So okay. here is one. And that is when you're talking to dancers, you're teaching dancers and there's a meanwhile figure in a dance. How do you make sure you keep their attention for the whole thing? Are there specific language choices that you use there? Well, there are a couple things you can do. Um, and I'm not always all that successful at it. Uh, you can say, you know, the ones do this thing. Meanwhile, loud, clear. And then say, okay, stop. Twos. While they're doing that, you do this. Blah, 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 blah. And then you can put them together. That's one thing you can do. Um, you can announce there's going to be a meanwhile um, and just say, so we'll, we'll go through eight bars for the ones, then we'll go through eight bars for the twos. Um, uh, Margaret Berry, thank you so much. Milton Erickson. Uh, <laughs> phew. Uh, that, for me, that's a hard one. And I always, I, I, no, that's really incorrect. You don't always anything. Um, unless you do, but that is not a good thing because, because that means you're not being flexible and, and trying different approaches. If one doesn't work, of course, you know what the the definition of madness is, it's doing the same thing again and again. Um, well, I'm so good at pulling myself away from the question with something that comes up. And, yeah, it's like, okay, the NFP, look, bird, distractible. Oh, I think so. Um, so here's so, another question that I'd love to have some time for. We have about five more minutes, I think. Okay. And that is if you would talk again about those moments of moving away from the mic. And, and what is that for? How do you use that? When do you use that? Who are you talking to at the moment when, when, when you're moving away from the mic and talking? Can you just sort of go over that one more time so we get sure. the, the critical point there? Well, you might be moving away just to speak to the band for a moment. We all do that. Um, I'm, I'm actually speaking to everybody. That's why you could take your mic with you and saying something that's not important. You know, they don't need to get it, but they might actually quieten down a whole lot if they can't hear it very well. Um, it's to break state, to shift people's attention, to shift your attention, um, to make, make it, uh, so the main reason is to break state, uh, have people let go of something stupid you did, <laughs> help them do that, uh, and yourself. Yeah, and and that the idea of doing something stupid <clears throat> brings up the thought for me of um, getting back again to managing your mind. If you make a mistake, about the last thing you want to do is stand there and ponder on it, or dwell on it, or try to figure out, well, how did I manage to, and meanwhile, time is passing. Um, the thing, best thing to do is to 
if it's important and you want to figure it out, just tuck it away for later, you know, put it on the, the sideboard um, and let go of it now in real time. Or you can just let go of it. The attitude to take, the most productive one really, is curiosity. Like, okay, I said this, and some of them did it, but some of them did that. And how was it I said this thing that led to that range of response? You know, meaning of communication is the response you get, and you get these different ones. So it may be dancer's level of experience and learning, or it may be something else, um, some word choices, but that's not a thing to ponder right there on the stage in front of people. I think I'm done with that. And I think we have one final question, another sort of ephemeral question, and that is, do you have any tips about developing a rapport with the dancers? How do you do yeah. that? Yeah, well, first of all, one of the very cool things about the kind of dancing we do is we are automatically developing rapport with our partners and neighbors, unless they're dancing quite strangely. And that happens. Um, but you know, we're, we're mirroring and matching. Uh, mirroring being doing, uh, well, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're looking in the mirror, the other person's there. And I'm gonna mirror my hand to myself. <laughs> um, uh, that develops rapport and typically at a non-conscious level. With the dancers, hmm. Well, if I'm somewhere where it's a more or less home dance or a place where I know some people, I always make sure to say hi, uh, to greet them. And if it's an away dance, I do my best to do that. You know, if I know this person and that person and that one, um, speak to them and, you know, that I, intention is to show other dancers too, to, I'm friendly, you know. I want to portray, um, you know, you're safe here. I got you. I can tell you what to do. And all you have to do is that thing. Um, it, 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 so many of us spend time making decisions, um, dwelling on this or that. You know, it's kind of restful <laughs> to just do what you're told. I think it was that way when I was in Dave Maceman's um, sword group, um, Iron Mountain Sword. Uh, he was teaching us. He was the leader. We knew it. <laughs> we appreciated it. And when he said, do this, we did it. And we didn't argue or try to fight about who was right. It was obvious that he was because none of us knew what the hell we were doing. But, you know, that's one situation. Um, so, smiling has, has that purpose too of getting rapport. Saying, especially if it's a local band, you know, where people know them in the dance hall, you know, make, making a connection with the band and inviting everyone to be in it together. Um, what, what did I say, especially if it's local? I don't know, anytime. Um, yeah, things that help you become them. Uh, someone comes up and says, it's Beryl's birthday. And, and so you do something about that, you know, the song. Um, 
think there are all kinds of ways that we develop a rapport with the dancers without even thinking about it. I mean, that's part of the job. And I think we, we, we all do really quite well at it. Because if the dancers aren't feeling something from you, a connection, they're not so likely to be really happy to do what you say. That's my belief anyway. Thank you, Mary, for sharing all of these thoughts and all of these ideas about language and different things that we can do as callers on the dance floor. And I know we're all looking forward to getting back out there and trying all of these things as things start to open up. And if you, all of you who are still with us here this evening, if you try some of these techniques, we'd love to know how they go for you. So please do stay in touch and let us know. I want to thank Mary so much for being with us this evening and talking about NLP and giving us lots of ideas that we can get started. Mary, thank you. You're very welcome. And remember what I've been saying, it's not proscriptive. It's whatever you want to try. And I use try as Joanna just did in its sense of trying it. And um, uh, yeah, let us know how it goes probably will go really well because I have that presupposition as you will that it's going to work great. great. So before we say goodbye this evening I want to just share a couple of events that are coming up from CDSS. I'm going to share my screen with you real quick. So several things are happening tomorrow. We have a new episode of ContraPulse that will be released and it features Anita Anderson, who's a wonderful musician from the West Coast. So it'll be great to hear that podcast. Common Time, which is this series, is taking a little holiday break in December, but I hope you'll be with us in January, on January 17th, which will be our next presentation. So stay tuned for an email. We'll let you know what's going on there. And we are having a course for callers starting at the end of January. Brooke Friendly is going to lead another series with her global terminology and positional calling course. We did that successfully about a year ago. And Brooke will be doing another session. And again, stay tuned for an email coming out about that soon with how you can register for that course that does have limited attendance. In addition to Brooke's course, she has also prepared a booklet with uh, global terminology and positional calling tips, instructions, all kinds of things, and that should be coming out next month. So we'll all look forward to that. And stay tuned for other fun programs coming up from CDSS in 2022, as well as an announcement about our camp season. So lots going on. Thank you all so much for being here with us this evening. You can unmute and say goodbye, say goodnight to Mary, and thank you all. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mary.